Welcome to Leadership and People. This is a series that pulls back the curtain on leadership by interviewing CEOs, senior executives, and entrepreneurs who've had large exits. We ask these experts about how they built trusted networks to rapidly grow their companies and what advice they wish they knew if they could do it all again. Today on the show, we've got part two of our episode with Troy Gregory, president at Hunt Electric. You know, knowing what the needs are for these clients and and understanding the value of removing uh, the headaches from them and giving solutions to their their issues and uh, being able to manage their budgets and their schedules and how important those different things are to them. Um, it puts you in a position to be able to support those sales teams and making sure that they're guided in the right direction. If you missed part one where we talked about growing the business to 100, over $100 million a year in revenue and 600 staff and these big giant projects um, that they do, uh, please go back and listen to that. Um, but Troy, I think... Um, what I want to start off with on this episode is thinking about leading your people to to grow the business to a hundred million dollars a year. Um, can you talk to the rest of us who want who might want to get our business over the hundred million dollar number? Yeah, I uh, first off, thanks for for having me on. And I, you know, you know, for us, um, it it was. Uh, really thinking long term and starting to put pieces in place that would ultimately lead us to uh, to be successful in that growth. And so a lot of the, the things that uh, has led to our success and where we're at right now um, are things that we put in place several years ago. And really um, a lot of it are, are cultural things that have been in place from day one with Hunt Electric. Um, but structurally, I think, you know, you kind of, as you're growing a business, you go through different uh, paradigm shifts. You go through different stages of that business that uh, they're disruptive. They, they, you have to change the way that you're doing things now. Um, you have to add in a uh, different level of management um, or you've got to have them look at things differently. And so a lot of, for us, a lot of a lot of those things um, we we were planning for several years and putting the right things in place, getting the right people in the right spots in the right place, um, getting them prepared to ultimately take on uh, bigger roles and bigger responsibilities. Um, I, I think those are the critical things that have led to our success. We we've, we've been a um, an organically grown company that uh, over time has had consistent growth. Um, and recently we've taken some uh, big leaps and, and what allows you to take those big leaps is making things, uh, making sure things are in place first. Um, I think, I think a lot of people, they, they head down that path and they think uh, ultimately that uh, those things will work themselves out along the way. Um, and that makes it really difficult. Um, no matter how, as you grow through these different levels as an organization, um, there's a lot of, a lot of challenges there. There's a lot of stress that's involved in it. There's a lot of, it, it causes people to be stretched at different levels. And, and so ultimately if you're trying to do that with the stress of just the additional workload because of the vo the volume growth that you've had when you're stacking those things up. Um, in my opinion, you're kind of setting yourself up for a disaster. But if you if you go back and you put those things in place first, and and you realize that you've got things uh, positioned the best you can, there's there's always you're always going to be able to uh, move quickly and adjust to things. But the best you can, put that roadmap in place, get those things, get get the people in the right spot, um, get them tuned up to those different levels and, and challenging them to uh, be prepared for that. And then ultimately when the growth comes, you still have the challenges that you, any business is going to have with growth, um, but they're not as challenging. They're, people are more prepared for them. So I think, I think that's a crucial uh, thing, Jess, that has helped us kind of continually grow, but then be able to manage some of these big growth uh, um, bumps that we've had uh, through these different uh, levels is is really putting the time in place ahead of time and and 
making sure that you're positioned well for it. So it's funny when you say that, I think your version of long-term thinking versus a lot of, <laughs> a lot of other people's is different, right? So uh, thinking about leadership, I know one of the leaders that you look up to is Richard Hunt, founder of founder at Hunt Electric. Can you give us a story or an example of, of a lot longer, longer term thinking than maybe the average folks do that you guys have done there? Yeah. I, I mean, the immediate thing uh, that comes to mind is uh, just his transition. Um, you know, I think a lot of business leaders, they, they, they work, they grow a company, then they get to a point where uh, they stop and they look and go, man, what are my options now? At this point, I'm, I'm, I'm getting tired. I've uh, done all this. And um, do I, you know, at this point, do I just sell? Um, or do I try to spin uh, another group up to, to manage and take this thing over? And, and I don't think they have the vision um, that Richard Hunt has had. And, and that's been a great example uh, to me and a lot of our other people to be, be thinking down the road further. So, you know, his transition plan was a 12 year plan and we're 10 years in on 12 years. And um, he has followed those steps uh, to a T that he laid out uh, clear back then. And that's, that's really difficult for people to do, but ultimately that's, that's uh, has led to my success and properly having me positioned to, to take the company over a lot of our other management team, it's allowed um, uh, them to have that kind of vision long-term of where we're going, what we're doing. Um, so that that's one immediate one that pops into my mind uh, with Richard is the guy is thinking uh, way down the road. And well, can um, we, can we talk about this for a second? Yeah. So, you know, I used to do mergers and acquisitions it's on, on an M&A team for Citigroup before I ran a private equity fund. Right. And you see a lot of buyout terms, you know, you talk about transition. It's like, you know, they want the executive team to stick around for 12 months or, you know, maybe up to 36 months. Right. Um, and, and here you guys are talking about one that's 12 years of a plan for that transition. Um, obviously that sends a message to everybody on your team, but can you talk about any specific examples of, of how you think that's been to your advantage to, to have a 12 year plan instead of a 12 month plan? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it comes back to uh, proper mentorship. So I, I would say, um, you know, ultimately what we're building this company for and, and what we're trying to achieve long term down the down the road. Um, I think I think if you if you go back to um, to that of having when you have a culture or you have something um that Richard's really passionate about and, and has been, he's organically grown this company. Uh, it started in his garage, uh, 32 years ago. And, and so when you're passionate about something and you want something to carry on long term, I think that's the more critical piece of, of, uh, making sure it's done right. And over time, um, I think, uh, you know, ultimately he's leaving this uh, business to the employees. And, and so another thing is his, his caring for the people that have been surrounded around him um, and want, wanting them to succeed and grow. Um, I think that's a crucial part of it. I think if it's all about, um, you know, sell a company and get somebody else in, I, I, I think Jess, you probably would understand the, the more challenges there of having a short term transition of a year or two years between somebody but if your thought process is really focused on the, the overall success of the business and to continue to grow, I think that takes a longer, longer time to, uh, to transition. Um, you know, when it goes back to mentorship, you know, in my case, a little on my background is I, I came through the trade. So, you know, the first third of my career um, was uh working through the field and understanding the construction side, the, the industry from the inside. Um, and then the last two thirds have been, um, I would say the second third has been really learning the management side, um, learning some of, uh, uh, the, more the management piece of this business and the world and the customer relationships and all, all the importing important functions and parts. And the last third has really been, uh, the stronger growth period of, of you know, and when somebody ha is there to help 
uh, be a mentor that you can go and bounce different ideas off of and stuff. It's really led to my growth and my, my success to where ultimately um, it's allowed me to, uh, to be able to put other management in place. If, if you look at our, our entire executive team and management team, we, we have um, a young group of people that are really energized and ready to go. And, and that doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen. If you try to do that in one or two years, that it just won't happen. Um, it, it takes a longer time to put those different pieces in, in place. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, but I, I, I look at some of these other businesses and even, even some really close friends that have businesses and they're, they're kind of in a point now where they're just now starting to look at it and they realize that they've kind of, they're, they're behind, behind it now and that they've got to figure out how to do it quicker and uh, come up with a way to do it. So not, not a lot of, not a lot of people I've, I've seen in, in, um, being surrounded by some great people, but I haven't, I haven't seen that out of many that have, uh, had that kind of vision, long-term vision to, to do it that way. Yeah. Well, it's obviously infiltrated the rest of your company. I remember when we were going through that stuff on the whiteboard with your team hearing about like how you guys are trying to take high school kids who, you know, not everybody's realizing that being an electrician is a six figure a year job if you do it right. And you guys have this whole map of how to take somebody from high school to a hundred thousand dollar a year job. You know, that's obviously over twice the national average for, for a salary in this country. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's a testament to, you know, getting the water to the end of the road, dig your well before you're thirsty kind of cliches, right? For you guys. Um, yeah, absolutely. My next, and obviously anybody who, who knows somebody who's interested in that, Troy's, Troy's looking, send them to huntelectric.com, right? <laughs> Always looking for good <laughs> Always people. Always looking for good people. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess my next question, though, is you came up through the trades. You know, there's a lot of folks taking over $100 million a year companies that, they went to Harvard and they did their, they were such and such at McKinsey and they have these pedigrees, right? And you come up through the ranks as an electrician and pay the price to learn all those skills in the real world instead of the classroom and get where you're at. But what about leading the sales teams, the business development teams? What, what lessons do you feel like you've learned when it comes to leading those people? You know, business development's a, a different animal than, uh, than maybe some of the more operational type roles. Sure. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would say that uh, we, when you understand your business and where you're going and uh, you're understanding the most important part of that and what's going to lead to the success. So to be specific to business development and, uh, you know, marketing I, I, or sales in general, um, I would say ultimately it's the customer. Um, that's ultimately what, uh, what their focus is on. And as a business, when the model and is really centered around the client or the customer and, and trying to add value and trying to uh, have an extremely satisfied customer, um, I think it puts you in a position to easily support those individuals. Now, you know, we, you know, where that's not my background or not my history. Um, but, but my knowledge is really around the client and ultimately what, you know, knowing what the needs are for these clients and, and understanding the value of removing, uh, the headaches from them and giving solutions to their, their issues and, uh, being able to manage their budgets and their schedules and how important those different things are to them. Um, it puts you in a position to be able to support those sales teams and making sure that they're guided in the right direction. I think the other thing too is uh, uh, focusing on the right client, the right people. Um, you know, that's we we you know with my past, my history and stuff is knowing who we're going to align with that we're going to ultimately are our hunt electric type people, um, or are like who we are and we, who we want to do business with and who we want to be a partner with and who we tr truly want to, uh, build those relationships with. I think that's where I can add value to, um, is the vision on, on what, what type of clients we align well with. And that ultimately we, I feel that we're going to be able to succeed in, uh, 
accomplish what we need well, to do to build those long relationships. Yeah, let, let's talk about that because, you know, everybody running an organization, we get offered money to do something that isn't straight up the fairway for us, you know, and it, it is so tempting to just take the money and grin and bear it, you know. Um, talk to me about the discipline to to stare money in the face and go, this is not a good alignment thing and actually say no. You know, like all sorts of salespeople claim, and we wouldn't take your business if we didn't think it was right. But really the qualification for right is, were you going to pay in American dollars? Okay, we'll take your business, right? <laughs> so yeah. so tell me about this, of, of have, being honest with yourself and having the discipline to turn money down. All right. For me, it all comes down to, am I going to do work with that client tomorrow and the next day and the next day? If I, I think somebody might be more vote motivated um, that if it's just a, a one-time job or a one-time service or a one-time product uh, to an end user or to a client uh, to to get distracted and be just focused on the the money and how they be, it best benefits them for that that uh, short-term thing and I think I think that's a real issue I think uh, a lot of people do look at it that way but I think I think ultimately when you come back and you you realize that the customer base that we're building, um, we want to do work for them now and we want to do work for them 10 years from now. Um, we have multiple uh, partners right now um, that we've done work for for several years. Um, one of them is a developer. Uh, we, you know, I don't know that I should use names, but there's multiple uh, uh, great developers out there. Um, a stack is one I'm thinking of, Peg, a bunch of others. Um, but stack, we've been doing work with those guys for, um, over 10 years now. And ultimately, you know, we want to make sure that we're giving them the best service at the best price. Um, and, and that we're focused on that because ultimately we want them to come back tomorrow and we want to have that kind of relationship where we can do work for them for, for 10 years. And if you're just focused on the, the bottom line, the, as much money as you can make, um, I, I think you're undermining that. I think ultimately that'll, that'll erode that um, relationship. So I'm noticing a theme here about long-term thinking over short-term thinking. <laughs> um, hey, I want to go back to something you said, though, because you talked about customer first. And everybody says that. Everybody claims, like, you know, find me an organization that doesn't claim to put customer first. But I can, when you say it, I can tell it means something different by your tone of voice. Can you talk to me about the the... I don't know what you see as the difference for you guys or, or how you, how you get sales reps. You know, I feel like I've been a sales rep since I was 15 years old, even when I was CEO of a private equity fund, just top sales rep. Right. And with, you know, there's a lot of short term thinking in sales. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, can you talk about this? Um, everybody claims to be customer first, customer centric, think about the customer. Um, can you get more specific into what you mean that maybe, you know, a standard that maybe not everybody else holds themselves to? Well, I, I think a couple examples are, is if, if your team, uh, you know, when leadership uh, hears you and sees you make a call that's aligned with that, with the, the client, that they can physically see you support what you're saying and backing it up, um, I think that starts to build it into your culture, right? I think... Uh, you know, you can say the customers first, but then when your your team and the uh, the people surrounded, you know, here working for us, when they see us physically do that and back it up and put our money where our mouth is, with, you know, hey, ultimately that this is what's best for the client. We're willing to do that, or we're focused on on this. We're if we've got to hit that price point, we're going to hit that price point for these guys. Um, when they see you, you know, back it up and do it that that starts to push it down down into your culture and then i think pushing up at the bottom is you know one thing i do is uh when we have new hire orientation i go spend 10 15 minutes uh, with all our new employees um shake their hand introduce them and and i spend that time talking about our mission statement and i always start that off with every company has a mission statement um, on the, but a lot of them, it's, it's just a plaque on the wall. It's something that they feel like they have to have, but ours means something to us. And, and I take them through it. Our mission statement is provide superior 
customer value through a culture of quality, integrity, performance, and versatility. Well, I ramble that off and I, I guarantee somebody listening to this goes, yeah, that sounds like ours. Um, so what, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, uh, they're, they're probably like, yeah, that's big deal. That's a good one. It's just like what we've got. So what I do is, is I take those employees in there and I break it down and I say, okay, quality, what, what does quality mean to hunt electric? And I give them specifics. I give them, I talk about, look, a lot of the work we do is going to be buried behind a wall or buried in the ground and no one else is ever going to see it. It's making sure that that product is going to last. It's making sure things are done right um, for our customers. It's, and I go through the little specifics. Um, integrity. It, you, you could ask 100 people to define integrity and it's probably going to be 100 different definitions. And so what I pointed out is what integrity means for Hunt Electric. And integrity for Hunt Electric is that we do the right thing for our customers and we do the right thing for our employees. And when we say we're going to do something, we back it up. And then I go through those, uh, those, those trust things um, and, 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 and break it down from there. But letting them know, you know, it, these are brand new employees. Sometimes they're, they're uh, young men and women coming right out of high school and letting them know that integrity for us is putting the customer first and doing the right thing for the customer. Um, performance, going into performance, that's what we're known for in this industry and, and let them know that, Hey, look, our, our reputation is around performance and it's, it's on, on all of us as a team uh, to keep that reputation. And, then and when, what when you that... say performance, you mean, unlike most of the construction world, we actually finish our stuff on time or we actually, <laughs> you know, we act like, t tell me what performance means in your industry. Performance for us is um, committing to these time schedules that, uh, that are being thrown out there and doing our part. When we say that we're going to hit a schedule, uh, we hit it and, and we do whatever it takes to, to back that up. We, we want to be the ones that we're challenging other subcontractor groups or other ones around us to raise the bar themselves and be a part of that team. Um, ultimately construction is a flow business. Um, everybody plays a part in that and, and they can't go before the other person a lot of times, but by performing, when, when you raise your game and you're putting pressure on the people in front of you, um, then ultimately that's going to lead to the success of the job. And, and also we talk about that, you know, performance is the big, complicated, really tough schedules, but then performance is also uh, the day-to-day, -day, you know, some of the smaller jobs that they're just as important to us to perform. And, and I even go break it down from that to say, look, I would love to sit here and say that we perform at our highest ability on every single job and we've never not performed. And that's not the case. It's recognizing when we don't, didn't perform, that we recognize it, that we learn from it. We find out why we didn't perform, uh, what was related to it and we fix it. And so I tie that into kind of the continuous improvement and stuff, but that's performance for us is we're, we're going to push everybody else around us to, to raise their game. And when we commit to doing something, we're going to follow through and we're going to get it done. It's interesting how easy that is to say. Uh, and especially if you have cultural norms for your industry that doesn't do that, how much, you know, how unlikely it is for the average firm to really hold themselves to that level. Um, well, listen, kind of closing off our, our second part here, second part of the interview. Um, you know, some of the things I've heard you say, and, and correct me if I'm getting these wrong about how, how to grow a hundred million dollar company, hundred million plus, um, long-term thinking, heavy focus on the human side, both, both your customer and your internal like leadership development and actually recognizing your people and actually saying it, not just thinking it, um, sounds like a real emphasis on the values repeatedly. It's not just some plaque on the wall. Um, what else would you close with as, um, you know, advice to other people who are, they're trying, you know, they want to go for that hundred million dollar a year, hundred million dollar a year revenue number. What, what would you, what would you end with? What would you close off with in addition to any of that? Um, you know, that, that does uh, circle it up pretty good. I, I would close it with, that ultimately, um, it, when you have the best people and you can retain the best people and you can attract the best people, 
uh, to the industry, it's going to make it a lot easier to achieve those goals and to be able to do it. Um, you've got to be able to make tough decisions and, and uh, ultimately get those right people in the right places that they're going to be successful um, and, and help them. But, you know, we talk about growth. Um, you're tying that to the growth. And we, we point out to everybody in this company on a regular basis that the reason we're growing is ultimately because we know long term for us to be successful, we need the best people. And the only way that we're going to get the best people um, on board by hiring them on or internally retaining them and growing them and keeping them uh, a part of our team, because we do have the best people in the industry. The only way that we're going to do that is through growth. Um, and it's because of opportunity. When we create opportunity, when, when you have the best people, they're looking for opportunity. They're looking for growth and how do they get challenged and how do they uh, – do that. And, and the only way I know to do that is through growth. And so ultimately it all ties together. Um, that that's why we're growing is so that we have the best people and the best people are what ultimately will lead to your success in, in growth. Yeah. Who wants to stick around somewhere where they don't think there's future opportunity where they're hitting the glass ceiling, right? It's not going to happen. Not the best people at least. Yep. Love it. Okay. Thanks for making time for this. Awesome. Thank you, Jess.